Hi, um, my name is Emma Dittmar and I'm one of the librarians at the Rocky River Public Library. And uh, I think you're in for a treat today. I always try and look for books that have a connection to Northeast Ohio and we have found a good one. And um, I would like to introduce our presenter tonight and her name is Ruth Morehard. And I've got a little introduction here. Please welcome Ruth Hanford Morehard, author of a new book about the greater Cleveland woman, her mother-in-law, Josephine Morehard, who started the nation's first boys baseball leagues during the Great Depression. When most young girls were playing with dolls, Ruth was memorizing the batting and earned run averages of major league baseball players. So it only seems natural that she would one day write a book about baseball. Mrs. Morehard and the Boys is that book, combining her love of the sport with another passion, writing. Among her accolades, Ruth, has, Ruth was honored to be invited to discuss and sign the book at the National Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, and she will present there again next May. The book was a monthly selection of nationally syndicated radio host Delilah's Book Club and the Farm Girl Book Club. Ruth is also the author of the practical nonfiction book, Wired to Move, several corporate histories and children's books. She lives in Chardon with her husband, Al, son of the books, Mrs. Morehard. And so we welcome you, Ruth. Well, thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here with you, Emma, and on behalf of the uh, Rocky River Public Library. Um, uh, this, as, as you will remember, this uh, presentation was originally scheduled for last May, but unfortunately the COVID or pandemic has uh, canceled a lot of things for a lot of people. Um, and tonight I'd like to start talking about the book by going back to another time that was difficult. I'll take you back 79 years to another September, in September 1941. It was a time when people were, were, were finally getting out of the devastation of the Great Depression, but feared another looming problem, and that was the war in Europe. Germany had uh, pretty much had taken over most of Europe, leaving only Britain uh, alone. And in the United States, we were, we were uh, trying to help Britain as much as we could. Um, and that is kind of the setting. That's what was going on back in, the, uh, um, in September of 1941. That's one of the things. Uh, one of the things that people really, that really helped people escape from the troubles back then was baseball. Baseball was definitely the national pastime then, and sometimes people would go to a game who hadn't had anything to eat, and they'd spend their last few dollars on, or actually about 25 cents on a hot dog. But um, on, on this particular day, September 28, 1941, one of the things that was happening in Philadelphia at Chai Field was a baseball player named Ted Williams hit a ball into the right field speaker in his last at bat of the season, raising his batting average to 406. And he was the last person uh, to ever bat over 400. But here in Cleveland, there was something else going on. And it was the first Little League World Series. The Little League World Series was between the Little Indians and the Little Cardinals and they were in League Park, which was the weekday home of the Cleveland Indians. And they were all decked out in replicas of major league uniforms. There were newspapers there, the stands were filled, and the, and the newspapers were talking about these players who, who were so much, uh, who, who played far beyond expectations. There was a batter that hit 7-11, there were batters on other teams that, that we're all hitting over 600, and these, th these newspaper reporters would come in to see the regular Cleveland Indians, and they were absolutely charmed with their, their miniature counterparts. Well, this is, on this day, 
the little Indians were the winners uh, over the over the little uh, over the little cardinals. And um, one of the things that amazed people more than anything, more than the play of these boys, was that the person behind all of this was a woman. And, and what an amazing woman she was. And I'm gonna ask Emma to try to turn on a, a clip that'll show you a little bit about her. Well, that tells you a little bit about uh, Mrs. Morehart. She was truly an amazing woman. But what's interesting is that uh, <laughs> We never would have known about this. I mean, there were some people, some of the old players remembered her. Al, of course, remembered her accomplishment. But it, her story had been long forgotten. And the only reason that I discovered it was I, I had only met her a very short time before she passed away. And uh, I, was help, I had met her son, Al, and we were cleaning out her house after she passed away. And I noticed a huge can of 16 millimeter film and on the, on the side, it said, bring up baseball. Well, I asked Al what that was all about. And he said, well, that film is about my mother. She started the Little League. And, she, and he said, the Cleveland Indians made that film about her and sent it all over the country. Well, I was a bit skeptical, to say the least. Uh, in, in my mind, I'm saying, sure, she did. But I was curious. So we rented a 16 millimeter projector. And we looked at the film. And I was absolutely stunned because there she was. She was looking down from, a, from the, the porch of her house and there were boys playing in the backyard. Then the next scene, she's on fields that she had created with backstops and stands and families, uh, women in, in hats and dresses and men in suits, which you'd never see today. Um, and boys out there on the field playing um, playing almost like they were major leaguers, really very skilled players. So uh, I obviously wanted to investigate further. And the more I investigated, the more I found out it was her story was a lot more than a story about starting baseball leagues. And her, her story was like a novel that uh, no one would believe. And as you saw in the, uh, in the short clip, she was one of 17 children. Her father was a tenant farmer, and she was one of the, well, she was probably the best uh, worker that he had among the children. She also had to help with the other children. She also had to help her mother clean house, and initially she was very eager to do it. But as time went on, she grew very tired of all the work. And she kind of, in one way, she admired her father because she saw that he was a good businessman who had made it on his own after coming to this country as, a, uh, as an immigrant at age 17. So she decided that she was going to go off on her own and make her own living without having any idea what that entailed. So at age 12, she walked away from, the home, from her home stating that she would never come back again and went to try to find a place to live and something to do. Well, the only job she could get was caring for kids, and uh, in housework. So she, 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 she did that. She went from place to place. Um, and she eventually, uh, with her father's help, she, she went to stenography school. So she, had, she, became, uh, she became a stenographer. But again, she was a woman and there were very few opportunities. And the job she got, I mean, most of the time her clothes were threadbare. Uh, her shoes, you know, had holes in them, um, and, and she often subsisted on, on peanuts and cracker jacks. Well, probably out of desperation, she married first one man and then another. You saw a little bit about them in the, in the clip. Um, the, for her first husband was a big, was a promoter who went at wherever money was to be made, and Unfortunately, he seemed to have left uh, wives in just about every place where he lived, unbeknownst to her. Well, after, well, after discovering and, and putting up with his alcoholism and uh, womanizing and uh, abuse for a number of years, she finally divorced him 
And uh, after that, uh, for a while after that, she married uh, another man, another very successful man with, who was also flawed, um, who owned a meat market. And she helped him in the meat market. And he also turned out to be uh, alcoholic and abusive. And as you saw in the, in the clip, um, she had a pretty hard life with him. Um, the husbands left her with two children, a daughter and a son. The daughter seemed to be doing fine. The son was beginning to act out and she was very concerned about him. You know, he had seen things as you saw in the clip, like his, his father chasing his mother around the dining room table with a meat cleaver um, and many, many other instances like that. He was beginning to act out. Um, she was very concerned about him. She had to work hard at the meat market and she knew she, she knew he needed her time, but she didn't know what to do. Um, one day she found that he had taken a BB gun and shot through leaded glass windows in a neighbor's home and she was absolutely horrified. And you know, she said, I've got to do something. And the next day she looked out the window and there was Junior with a baseball bat, with a baseball cap, an Indian's cap on his head, holding a stick and batting at a tennis ball. And she knew he loved baseball. He, she, his favorite player was Bob Feller. And she just felt that she needed to do something. And maybe that something was baseball. So she marched up to the mayor's office and asked if there was a team that he could play on. Well, the mayor didn't know of any teams. But he said, if you want to get the neighborhood kids together, we'll let you use the field and back at town hall. So she did that. They used the field and back at town hall for a while. The only problem was the land was sloping and the balls would run into the street and there was not really room for an outfield. So she was determined she was going to find a place for these kids to play. One day she was out, uh, she and Junior were out looking to get something to eat at a place called Lenny's Chicken in the Basket. And she pulled in there and she saw this huge field and the, you know, the, the light bulbs went off and she thought, well, maybe we could make this into a baseball field. So she went and she, she found out who the developer was and she charmed the developer into letting her use the field for, as a baseball field. She got the boys together, got them trying to clean up the field. The only problem was the grass was knee high and there were stones and trash all over and it was more than they could handle. So again, she goes back to the mayor's office and she says to the mayor, she says, you know, it would be a great thing for the town and this is in University Heights, Ohio. It would be a great thing for the town if the boys had a baseball field. So why don't you get your people together and uh, get your crews and help us make a baseball field? And the mayor did. So pretty soon the, the, the city crews were there and they were leveling the field. They were creating an infield and cutting the grass for an outfield. And she had her field. Well, the boys, of course, wanted their team to be the Little Indians. Um, and so if their, her team was going to be the Little Indians, they had to have Indians uniforms. So she went down to the neighborhood sporting goods store, and there was a man named Let Letty Placek, who was a Wilson sporting goods representative. And she asked him if the boys could, could have uh, Indians uniforms. Well, he also happened to be the head scout for the Cleveland Indians. So he went to the Indians, he got permission for the boys to to wear uh, Indians uniforms and he got the uniforms and gave them to her at cost. Now, meanwhile, you know, this is, the, this is 1937. The depression is still underway and she's got very little money coming out of her meat market. I mean, her, her, her customers, you know, a lot of them couldn't even pay and she, she'd build, she'd have tabs um, run up for them, which she had no idea that they were ever, ever going to pay. But, she got the uniforms, that the boys had these wonderful little Indians uniforms. And the only difference between their uniforms and the uniforms of the real Indians was there was an Indian on the, on the arm of the, real, of the real uniforms. And the boys' arms were so small, they had to put it on the back. But they had their, they had their uniforms, they had a team. Now, who were they gonna play? Well, there were a few teams. The Catholic youth organizations had, had started teams, but they also were looking for people to play. And there was a group called the Hilltoppers uh, that had started, a, they had started their own team and were looking for people to play. 
So this is how she started. People kept seeing these boys playing on this nice new field and people from all over wanted to, wanted to join in. So she kept building uh, teams and they all wanted the uniform. So the Hilltoppers and the, um, the CYO team became the little Yankees and the little White Sox. And as she added more teams, they were all um, miniature versions of American League teams. Uh, they came from all over the area. Um, uh, orphanages sent some of their kids. Orphanages way over on the west side of Cleveland sent some of their kids. Um, but the, she had she had more more players than she knew what to do with, so she just kept adding teams. Well, that that made her think. Well, this they 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 all have uh, they're all like American League teams. They all have replica uniforms. So why don't we make this the Junior American League? So that became the Junior American League. Well, what was next was that she started a little national league. And again, more and more teams, again, with, with, uh, with the national league uh, team names and uniforms. And then, of course, the next step, she wanted to have the Little World Series that, that I mentioned. Well, she had the Little World Series, and, you know, it was a, it was a huge hit. I mean, um, as I mentioned before, newspapers all over the country covered it. Um, and so that was her, you know, that, that, was, that was her crowning glory. But what I should also mention is that um, she, was not, she wasn't content just to have the boys playing and, and, and she wanted them to learn to play the game and she wanted the game to teach them. So she had Laddie Plasek and um, Bob Feller and Jeff Keith and Roy Weatherly who were all stars on the team. They would help, they would, they would teach, they taught the boys how to hit and pitch and field and catch and um, imagine what, what it was like for those boys to have that kind of an opportunity to learn from these, these wonderful players and scouts. She also had professional umpires. One of the umpires was a 22-year-old high school teacher and coach named Hal Leibowitz. Now, if you, many people will remember him because he was a longtime editor, sports editor of the Plain Dealer. He was also a columnist for the Sporting News, and he has since been inducted into the writer's wing of the National Baseball Hall of Fame. Well, he was an umpire, but after the games, he'd, only, he'd almost become a coach to them, too. He'd bring them aside and he'd say, okay, what do you think you could have done better? Never negative always positive. What do you think you could have done better? And pretty, most of the time the boys knew exactly what they had, uh, what they had done, what they could improve on, and they told him. And he just let them, let them do that. Another player uh, who, who, who happens to be one of my favorite Indians players is a, was a pitcher named Mel Harder. Mel Harder used to come to the games and he used to often invite the boys over to his house, which imagine what a thrill that was. He'd give the boys soda and he'd give them popcorn and he'd regale them with stories about the big leagues and the players. And one thing he always told them was to play to win, but it's more important, more important than winning is to, it is to enjoy the game and to be good sports. And that fit into Mrs. Morehart's philosophy too. She wasn't looking to, to create major leaguers. She, was, she wanted baseball to teach the boys to grow up right. And she felt there were lessons that they could learn from baseball. You know, when, when she started, I mean, she had one boy that was somersaulting across the, the outfield. She had other boys that were yelling at the umpires and she wasn't gonna have anything to do with that. So she had rules and she had a whistle. And the boys knew if they were out of line, that whistle would blow. She'd never yell at them but they'd hear that whistle and they'd know that they were doing something wrong and they'd stop it. She also had a very peculiar uh, thing that she made the boys do before a game. The day before, they had to do a good deed and they had to tell her about it. Well, that, that was basically, um, that was her philosophy. She'd have the boys over to her house and she'd say, look, you can do anything you put your mind to. But you, what you want to do is, is just look at what just look at what I've been through and look at what I've done. Her, you know, her whole philosophy was was making sure the boys grew up. Right. Uh, she um, 
she started in 1937 when the war, well, we talked about September 28th, the Little World Series, but if you remember, just about two months after that, the uh, Pearl, Pearl Harbor was bombed, and the whole the whole tenor of the of the country changed. Everything turned toward the war effort, as you can well imagine. Funds were going toward the war. She was having a harder time raising funds to support the baseball team. She was pretty much, you know, started supporting it pretty much on her own. But in 1942, she actually had her best year. She added teams, she you know, lots more players, but as time went on, uh, it became more and more difficult. Uh, as the war went on, uh, fathers were going to work, mothers were you know, going to work, um, gas was rationed, the kids couldn't get to the games, and she was you know, using far too much of her money to, to try to support the leagues. So very reluctantly in 1944, she had to, to, uh, to terminate terminate the leagues. Um, now, what's interesting is that the, uh, the Little League started two years after, the Little League we know today started two years after her junior leagues. Um, and they also struggled during the war, but they had a, um, they had a, a, a little different business model. They had businesses supporting each one of the teams. So they managed to struggle through the war and they actually picked up uh, after the war was over. Um, they had their first Little World Series in 1946. Um, but uh, um, there's no question that uh, Mrs. Moorhart Lee's kind of set the standard and the Cleveland Indians made a film about her, uh, which was which uh, the, the team in Williamsport, which is now the, the one of the Pumaga leaders, wanted to see it. And we don't know if that had any impact on them or not, but we do know that they did see the, see the film. And that's, uh, that's a capsule version of uh, what Mrs. Moorhart and the boys is all about, but her story is really an amazing one. That, uh, well, I will say I didn't know her other than for about a m couple of months before she passed away but it certainly inspired me. If anyone has any questions, <clears throat> please go ahead and type them in. Um, I had asked Ruth, because I don't remember from the book, how much formal schooling did Josephine have? She, uh, she only finished the eighth grade. Did she? But she went to stenography school. Yeah which, you know, which gave her a skill. Um, but she was, you know, but she was very much up on everything that was going on. She, she educated herself, uh, which had to be kind of difficult with the kind of life she led, but, but she, she attempted in every way to educate herself. I forget, her first husband though, didn't they do a lot of traveling and <laughs> yeah. in fancy places and stuff? I don't oh, remember yeah. exactly. Yes. Um, her, well, her first husband, as I said, he went anywhere there was money to be made. And after she married him, they decided to go to, well, they decided to go down to Florida. Florida was, Florida was in the midst of a huge land boom. And so he went down there and um, he, he had a lot of money at the time. And he invested his money in property. And I've got ads that show some property he was selling that was in Sarasota. It was right next to the Ringling's estate. They got to know the Ringling brothers and uh, Joseph, uh, Josephine's daughter, Geraldine, got to ride a camel, one of the Ringling <laughs> brothers' camels down the street of Sarasota. And they were very prominent. I mean, they were hobnobbing with celebrities um, and they were, they were, they were really living, living it up high. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. the land boom went bust. Okay. <laughs> And uh, George uh, Giroux, which was, was her husband's name, lost, uh, lost all of his money and uh, began drinking even more heavily. Uh, and so they, uh, they ended up uh, taking a camp, you know, camping on the way back. To I see. He's the one, too, that had multiple wives in different spots. He, he had multiple wives. I mean, you know, I could almost write a book about him. I, he was a lawyer. Um, 
and a promoter. I mean, he went to he went to the coal mill coal fields of West Virginia when that was booming, and he made a lot of money there. The next time you saw him, he was out in Los Angeles, where oil was booming, and he got the, well. He got he got in with the AFL uh, leader, uh, ended up engaged to his daughter. His daughter must have found out something about his past because she abruptly broke off the engagement. The next thing you knew, he was up in um, San Francisco and he was running a hotel in San Francisco and there was an article in the paper, um, some girl from West Virginia said, I'm looking for my father. I understand he's uh, running a hotel in San Francisco and I'm destitute and I need to find him. So I guess I guess she was able to, to, to find him then. Well, the next time we, we saw him, he was in South Florida. He was in uh, South Beach in Miami, and he was running a hotel there. And the hotel was owned by Clevelanders, which is what got him to Cleveland. I see. Obviously unaware of all of his past. Yeah, wow. Um, is Josephine's daughter alive? Josephine's daughter has passed away. Yes. Was she in Ohio also? Yes. Yes. Okay. And, um, Josephine has grandchildren here in Ohio, uh, in the, um, the Cleveland, uh, Ashtabula area, and in the Tampa, Florida area, and in the Youngstown area. Okay, um, cool. No great grandchildren there. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Excuse me. She does have great grandchildren also in those, in those areas. Well, you know, I just couldn't believe her life. Amazing. Her life yeah. Amazing. I, you know, it, was, it wasn't just that she left home, but I mean, she was, she was such a hard worker. And she wasn't afraid to ask for what she needed. She wasn't afraid of anything. And, and that, carried, you know, that carried through. I mean, she's, she's asking Albert Bradley to use Lee Park. Not many, and, and just think about what, what it was like for women back then. Yeah. You know, I mean, here, she, here she's running a meat market. There's no support services available in terms of her children. Um, and, you know, she's, she, she's during the Depression, you know, if she couldn't get meat, um, she would go, she would march up to the, to the uh, meat suppliers and she'd tell them, you're going to give me meat. I mean, she, she, she was totally fearless and she was fearless. <laughs> I used to think, uh, you know, I sometimes think she was like uh, Tom Sawyer, a female version of Tom Sawyer, because she was yeah. always getting into scrapes. And she'd, and she'd very often feel the sting of her father's riding whip. I see. Because, I mean, once she even burned down the, you know, a barn with lots of little pigs in it, and she loved the little pigs, and she didn't... Oh, I remember that, that. yeah. 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 She didn't mean to do that, and she was totally heartbroken. But, yeah. you know, she just went fearlessly ahead, her whole life. It was amazing. I wish I had that much fearlessness. <laughs> and, and all that energy, too. And energy, right. And energy. What happened to the meat market? I know she retired from it at some point. Yes. Uh, I, I don't remember the year. It mm -hmm. was sometime, I think, in the late 1940s. She, um, you know, she had, uh, she, she, she had done her, her duty. And she yeah. had a cousin who had a broom factory, and uh, he, well, it's, it's a very tragic story. Um, he was blind in one eye, and he was helping her one day uh, install some electrical wires with another man, and, the, and, and there was a hole in the floor where they're putting the wires through, and uh, he was looking down at the end, and the wire came through and blinded him in the other eye. Oh dear! She felt, I think she felt very, very uh, responsible, even though it wasn't her fault. So mm -hmm. she decided to help uh, the cousin that was running the broom factory. So she applied her usual energy to that. I did. Um, I have access to the historical um, plane dealer, a database through the library, and. I'm sure you had seen this article, but it's dated January 20th, 1954. And Grandma proves gay blade in dare. Yeah. Uh, she, the kids in the neighborhood, or I guess a granddaughter, wanted to surprise Josephine with some special activity. 
Can you tell us about that at all? Well, yeah. Or does your husband remember that episode? He does not remember that. Uh, he, he does I, not. I, I saw it in the same place you saw it. Uh-huh. And, uh, BJ is um, BJ Frampton is uh, is is her granddaughter who lives down in uh, Vienna, Ohio. And uh-huh. you know, it was BJ, and B, BJ was was her daughter Ger- Geraldine's daughter, um, and who was uh, who was born on an army base and traveled all over the country. But when when her father was stationed where they could not live, uh, BJ and her and her mother and her younger brother came to live with. This is more hard. Oh, okay. And so um, she has wonderful memories of her, and in this case, they went ice skating. <laughs> and I don't remember. I can't. I can't remember how old she was at the time. Sixty-one, it says. And she was. And she was. <laughs> she, she, and she was ice skating. She would do anything for her grandchildren. Uh, they really. Had wonderful stories about her. And one of the things they say is that she always talked to them just the same on their level. You know, they were they were people to her. They weren't children. You know, she 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 talked to them the same way she would talk to anybody. She never condescended or never talked down to them. Mm-hmm. And they just loved her. Everybody loved her. You know, she must have been a good cook too though. Oh, Didn't yeah. she have these big uh, roast events? Yes. At so, some of the games. When she in, in order to uh, in, in order to fund the leagues, she used to have ox roasts. On uh, usually on the town hall property, and the you know the player the Indians players would come, and so they would draw a lot of people. So sure. she spent a lot of money uh, on the Oxford. But yeah, she, uh, from what I understand, she was a wonderful cook, and uh, yeah. people still tell me about the brownies that she used to make. Oh really? That were, that were you know I don't know two inches with another inch of frosting. <laughs> Which, Do you have the secret recipe? No, I wish I did. But, you know, uh, her son remembers when he was in, in, in law school, she'd send him up to him in law school. Oh, how cool. How cool. You know, I also did find her obituary uh, when I was looking for information about Josephine. And uh, I find it, and I'm not sure who would have written it. Maybe your son was in, or not your son, your husband. It was her daughter at the time. Daughter, okay. Because it does mention that she was a Methodist Sunday school teacher. And I thought that was so cool that that's part of the obituary. That's part of the Plain Dealer article. You know, in addition to her accomplishments with the Little League and, and all of that. But also that she was a Sunday school teacher. She was. She was. She was a very religious person. Uh huh. Uh, for for a time, she was very in, enthralled with Mary Baker Eddy, who as a, was a female and who started her own religion, and who right. also had a very difficult life. Um, right. So she, you know, she followed her, but she, you know, she definitely, you know, she taught Sunday school. She, she just, she, she was involved with the, the city. She was involved with the, the mayor. She, oh, I, oh, she ran all kinds of programs for the mayor. I mean, she just, she never stopped working. I mean, she was, if she wasn't at the meat market or the broom factory, she was doing something for somebody. One of the things that I think, that I thought was really, was really neat was, uh, it, when she had the Little World Series, um, she, made, she made sure all the proceeds went to charity. Mm-hmm. And not to just any charity. But Britain was standing alone at the time. You know, Germany had conquered pretty much all of Europe except Russia. And it looked like Britain was going to be next. And Britain was enduring terrible bombings. And a lot of the British were sending their children to the United States and other countries that were not affected by war. I mean, imagine what that's like to have to send your children away because you're afraid that they might die in, in the war. And uh, one of the children in the neighborhood that was a friend of, of Al, who was then called Junior, um, had come from had come uh, from England, uh, and a lot of the people in the neighborhood were Jewish, and she knew what was happening with uh, the Jews in Europe, and she just uh, it was very important to her that some money that any money that she could raise go to British, British war relief. Which is about the only place you could you, know, you could send it because the rest of uh, of, German, of uh, Europe was under German control. 
But, mm -hmm. um, you know, Al has got, you know, he remembers the, the British boy well. And, you know, they, they sent their children over, um, not just for them to be safe, but because they were afraid there wouldn't be a Britain mm -hmm. unless they had people to come back and, and uh, rebuild. Yeah. Very sad. Yeah. Very, sad. Very sad. Well, your your mother in law was quite a woman, that's for sure. She was. I wish I had known her better and had had a yeah. chance to interview her. It would have been fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> Are there any um, tape recordings of her at all that exist? The only thing we have, I have, I have notes that she notes. wrote when, when, when you know. Years later, she kind of looked back on her childhood as being idyllic. Mm -hmm. Really? <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing how time changed. What time? <laughs> <laughs> um, and she started to write about it. So she okay. started, got all of these uh, handwritten and typewritten pages talking about her life, which are wonderful. Those um, are great. Uh, I don't have anything about the baseball league. So that, you know, I had to, I had to do a lot of research on my own. Sure. On Sure. Uh, her early life, she did document uh, very well, but yes, and of course the film, the film, right? Baseball, which I, which I have on YouTube, by the way, if anyone's interested, you can just uh, plug in "Bringing Up Baseball" and, and uh, you'll find it. Yeah, I did see that. Yeah, it's amazing, it's isn't it? I mean, it's very yeah. 1940s. <laughs> yeah, but cool, you know. It, yeah, it, it's it's very neat. Um, and Twinkie <laughs> Hunter, who was. Uh, one of the Indians' announcers was uh, narrated the film, which was which was kind of neat too. There was also an article in the newspaper I found where um, the little Indians had like a special reunion for Mrs. Moore. Yes, Hal Leibowitz, as I mentioned, the, 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 the uh, who was one of her umpires. He just loved the, the, the teams, and you know, um, and uh, he he wasn't uh, he wasn't with a newspaper. Uh, while the leaves were going on, but he continued, you know, he, he, he just loved Mrs. Moorhart and, and everything that she had accomplished. And he actually wrote in a 1960 column that um, if her leagues hadn't ended during the war, um, University Heights, Ohio would probably be the home of Little League today. Oh, really? Yeah, but there was, an, um, there was a reunion. Um, I mean, this is how much the you know, her boys loved her. 30 years later, the, the boys decided to hold a reunion of the teams, but really for her, and it was right before Mother's Day because they considered her to be their second mother. Sure. Um, and sure. I mean, they came from all over. And, you know, this time they were all, I mean, they were all successful. They had turned out to be successful people, which is what her objective was in the first right. place. Yeah. Um, we presented her with a baseball pin, and we have uh, we still we still have a uh, a baseball with all their names on it, and we still have her whistle, by the way. <laughs> and I'm trying I'm trying to see if I can't get the National Baseball Hall of Fame to do a display, but that's a long shot. <laughs> <laughs> um, but your um, it wasn't just the reunion, but you know if if Al and I would go to uh, his high school reunions, or even walking down the street, people would always come up to him and tell him how much they loved the leagues and how much his mother meant to them. I mean, it's just amazing. And they also, at the reunion, they told her they wanted to get her some recognition. And she said, oh, no. She said, she said, I accomplished what I wanted. Look at, look at all of you. You, you know, you've turned out to be great mm -hmm. young men. And um, so she said, no, don't bother. So I guess it fell to me to try to get her some recognition. Well, I think it's a wonderful book and I heartily recommend it. And uh, the book is on Kindle. It is in large print, uh, hardback and also paperback, yeah, just if anyone is any interested in purchasing it. But uh, yeah, I would heartily recommend it. And I sure do thank you. I don't know if we have any other questions um, here at all. But I appreciate your time. And this is going to end up being on the Rocky River Public Library YouTube um, channel at some point in the near future. And then I'll let all the attendees know um, where it is. And it'll be advertised, too. So. Great. Thank
Thank you. I enjoyed this very much, and thank you, Emma, and thank you, Rocky River Public Library, and I encourage everybody to take advantage of Rocky River Public Library. It's a wonderful Well, we appreciate it, even during this time, right? We're still there. <laughs> but I'm guessing you're still doing what you can do. We're doing what we can, yeah, yeah. And I appreciate you doing this virtually. Oh, this, this so. has been great. It's nice that we have the opportunity, to, uh, no, excuse me, opportunity to do things virtually because, I mean, certainly everything is shut down everywhere. Else. Yeah. Well, you take care. You too. And, thank and good night. Bye-bye.